Okay. Okay. Well, good morning. Technically, it's almost afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us for this lecture. I'm very excited to introduce my colleague. Um, and I want to say just a few words before she gets started with her presentation. So Ashley Zampogna Krug received her PhD in history from the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, where she studied the impact of U.S. immigration restrictions on Italian transnational communities and their migration patterns. She's written articles on anti-fascist refugees, the Madadi family, and U.S. immigration policy for various academic journals. Since 2015, she has served as the faculty advisor of the Dreamers Plus Club, and she has utilized her scholarly background to support immigrant students at Brookdale and educate others about modern immigration issues. The Dreamers Plus Club is open to any student who wishes to engage in activism to support the rights of immigrants. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Ashley. And I also want to say that I will be monitoring the chat. Um, and if you have questions, feel free to comment in the chat. All right. <clears throat> so I should go. OK. All right. Hello, everybody. Before I, as I was just saying, I'm, I'm not even quite sure how long this is going to take. I started doing research on <clears throat> the border wall and the environmental impact on it started over the summer. And, uh, you know, told Kelsey, I would, I would love to do a presentation on this. Um, I do not by any means consider myself to be an expert on this. And I've realized after starting to research this, that there it is much larger and more complicated than I ever anticipated. Um, so <clears throat> I will share what I have found so far and um, uh, go from there. And hopefully we'll have time for questions um, and all that good stuff. <clears throat> all right. Whoa. Next, OK. So <clears throat> I think for us, um, being that I'm, and I'm assuming that most, most of us, at least right now, are Northeast dwellers. Um, so when we think of the Southwest border, you know, this border that we share with Mexico, I think for many of us, this is what comes to mind. Um, and when I wrote the article for the GCP newsletter, you know, talking about uh, this uh, <clears throat> border wall and the environmental impact, I think sometimes from our perspective, we're a little bit far removed from it, literally geographically. But when we see a map, we just see this line. Um, you know, that, that goes along the map. This one does show how much border wall has been built um, and, um, you know, number of vehicles on those border posts. And then you can see the Rio Grande. And as you can tell, most of that is um, not fortified by any kind of um, border. But I think that just seeing it in this perspective uh, really makes it difficult for us to um, really recognize the environment that's there and the communities that are there and that the impact that a wall can have on those. Um, because this looks much different than this, right? You're seeing a stretch of the Rio Grande and what is probably some of among the most beautiful natural landscapes in our country that are along this border that we share with Mexico. And I'll be showing, <clears throat> you know, a few more images um, of some of these landscapes as I go through the presentation, but I wanted to give right at the beginning this kind of contrast between that line on the map and what we see when we're looking at the landscape. So for this uh, presentation, I'm going to start by just trying to give the audience a little bit of a sense of what the border environment is like. This is gonna, going to be my, by no means um, complete, but just to give you some samples because it's a very extensive border, right? But um, again, since we're not geographically close to this location to give us um, some vision of what it, what it looks like, what the animals are like, plant life, et cetera. Um, I'll go into a brief history of wall construction going basically from 1945 to present, and then give some examples of that environmental impact throughout that time frame. 
um, looking at animals, plants, and habitats, and then also human communities. And the whole time that I was, you know, doing research for this presentation, I kept like channeling Rachel Carson in my, in my mind. Um, and, and you'll notice in this presentation, I really consider human communities to be part of the environment when we're talking about this. And that if there's a negative impact, not only on certain animals or certain plant life, there's also a negative impact on humans. I think that's part of the environment in my perspective. Of course, others might disagree with that. Um, but to find, you know, Carson argued that there could be a way to have humans work with nature, right? To achieve what we want to achieve rather than work against it, rather than try to conquer it. And perhaps even in border security, there's a way to do that, to work with it rather than try to uh, conquer it and work totally against it. <clears throat> All right, so this borderlands region and some background information on it. It's approximately 1,954 miles of border uh, between the United States and Mexico and uh, unites tropical and temperate zones. So there are <clears throat> some of very unique um, habitats in this environment. I'll show some of them. And throughout this whole nearly 2,000 mile um, border, it's also super diverse. So there's, of course, you know, desert environments, there are mountains, there's the Rio Grande River, which is taking up a huge part of it. And then even beyond just a sort of natural landscape, um, there's also a number of national parks that sit on the border and are some of them on both sides. Um, there are urban areas, think of El Paso, right? Think of San Diego. There are <clears throat> those two that are sitting along the border. So whether it's natural or metro or national park or mountain river, there's a lot of different, um, there's a lot of variants there. Um, but it's in this area, it contains some of North America's, you know, most unique and rarest species of all kinds of animals um, and also has some of our oldest cultures. So there are Native American nations that are located along the border that have been around right? Their people, their ancestors go back thousands of years. There are Paleolithic cave paintings and stuff, you know, in locations at the border. So we have um, some of our very important human history um, in this region as well. So to give, you know, some sense, uh, and these, these come from uh, the Sierra Club, which I'll mention later too, which really documents a lot of this, uh, more than 450 rare species um, about 700 birds, mammals, and insects migrate through the borderlands every year. And I just think of the, you know, the monarch butterfly migration as being a great example of that. Um, and their, their, you know, annual migration to Mexico, which occurs um, every year. And that's why I have a picture of the monarch butterflies <clears throat> up. All right, but there are also other animal species. So I just wanna show a few pictures, again, to give us a visual of the kinds of animals that live in uh, some of these regions. Uh, animals like jaguars that do migrate or have migrated, try to migrate <laughs> on either side of the border. Um, the Sonoran longhorn. There are so many different uh, uh, types of birds that live in some of these different habitats and you have some examples here and then also the desert longhorn as well or bighorn sheep I just had the longhorn up um, as another one so some of these like the bighorn sheep um, black bears too even though I don't have them up here some of these animals earlier in history had been extirpated from some of these locations, which means that they disappear in that particular location. So some of them are now just rebuilding their populations um, after, you know, deliberate efforts to try to do so. All right, so one of the habitats that I wanted to spotlight, um, because I had known very little about, about this um, particular kind of habitat, but it's the Sky Islands. Um, and on the map you can see their location, where they're found, north, northwestern Mexico and the southwestern United States. Um, and these in particular house 
incredibly diverse habitats and different kinds of animals that many of them don't exist anywhere else. Um, so this is, you know, certainly something that's really unique and special um, for this area. And they, these sky islands, they're like mountains that rise up from the deserts and they provide a habitat that certain animals can live in, but they cannot live, you know, say in the, in the desert area surrounding this particular, you know, little sky island. Now, certain animals like the jaguars will actually migrate from one sky island to another and they'll use the river corridors among them to um, migrate. Uh, but some of the animals here have been already negatively impacted. I've got this leopard frog picture here. And the Sierra Club reports that as one example, right, this leopard frog used to be found at 400 different aquatic sites in this Sky Island region, and now it's only found at 80 aquatic sites. So it is um, diminishing. And if you were to go, I don't think I'm going to open it up just in the interest of time, but I had this linked here. You can go to the Sky Island Alliance and they have images documenting like the rare orchids that are on these islands, all the different kinds of animals and plant life. Um, they've got it documented. And of course, it's part of an effort to try to preserve and maintain this environment, which is becoming more difficult to do with this border wall going you know, right through um, these areas. But I encourage you if you want to check it out and just you know, to be able to see vividly some of that imagery, um, the Sky Island Alliance is the place to go for that. <clears throat> All right, so that was brief. Of course, you know, there's so many different, just wanted to give you like a little taste of some of that uh, a, a vision of, of what some of that looks like along the, along the border. Um, so now we'll get into the history of the fence. And you'll notice at first I'm talking about it as a fence because I feel like that that's really what it was. And then I'll start talking about it as a wall as it kind of shifts and what it looks like and, um, and that. So the first fence goes up in 1945 uh, with the intent to curb undocumented immigration across the border. Um, this was kind of your standard chain link fence, right? Um, it was about six feet high. Um, uh, I'm, I'm, yeah, about six feet high. <clears throat> this actually came from the Crystal Lake um, internment camp in Texas. So they took fencing from that internment camp and repurposed it and started using it across the border. Um, now there was an immediate impact after putting up this, you know, starting to put this chain link, chain link fence up uh, across the border. There was protest from Mexican border communities. Um, and as I get to the end of my presentation, I'll talk a little bit about the communities that are there um, and, uh, you know, how, how long there, there, has, there have been communities. So it, it, it's understandable that there were protests, you know, to put a wall up when communities had been together for so long without that there. Um, and so as early as the 40s and 50s, Border Patrol officers started picking up migrants in the deserts um, and in the mountains um, as well. And these were border crossers that had to circumvent or tried to circumvent that border wall. So in 1952, there were five, five Mexican men found dead near Superstition, Superstition Mountain in California. Um, and I'll be coming back to this again, because this ends up being, in terms of uh, impact for humans, um, um, even though there are others, for migrants, the building of the fence, and then of course, as it evolves into a wall, pushes them into the more remote regions of the border. So there is a consequence of greater migrant deaths as they're forced to go to the deserts to cross, um, go to the river, right, and cross the Rio Grande, notably. So um, this <clears throat> information that I had on the on the um, first wall here comes from um, a book called Migra, which is on a history of the Border Patrol by Kelly Lytle Hernandez. And she actually argues in her book that this initial step in building the fence starts to shift enforcement violence away from Border Patrol and and situates it in the environment. So that becomes what's causing the harm to those migrants who are crossing. It's, it's less border patrol and more the environment as they 
you know, seek out those areas to cross. <clears throat> Whoops. All right. So that chain link, fence, chain link fence stays up really through the 50s, the 60s, into the 70s, right? That's the kind of fencing that um, remains. I found there was an interesting article from the New York Times I found in 1978 where they were reporting making improvements to the fencing um, in some locations. You see those locations in Texas and California. And you know they were reinforcing this chain link fence. And I found it interesting, President Carter at the time, you know, they were, they were actually trying to make the fence so that it wouldn't cause harm to individuals. They, they were making sure it wasn't sharp, that if individuals were climbing over it, that they wouldn't get hurt, um, which I thought was interesting. And President Carter had said um, at the time, and it was reported in this article, that he didn't want any sort of fencing that would injure people to be um, put up. So it's not until the 1990s, this is when we start to see a serious escalation and growth in the fence along the border. And I would say this is like moving towards turning this fence into a wall um, and really trying to fortify sections of the border. So this first step is under the Clinton administration <clears throat> with Operation Gatekeeper, which was passed in October 1st of 1994. And of course, this is passed in conjunction with, in a sense, but, you know, out of this expectation that NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, was going to lead to greater migrant crossings. So it's kind of interesting. It's such a paradox, right? We want free trade, of product, but we don't want the people to come with that product. So, so this they um, there was this effort to fortify the border. So under Operation Gatekeeper, the focus was really on urban areas. So the photo that I have here is San Diego, and this is uh, in 1989 before it becomes more heavily fortified at the border. So you can see a number of migrants there waiting to um, cross along that river valley. Um, so San Diego becomes heavily fortified. <clears throat> uh, El Paso is another city that becomes fortified um, under Operation Gatekeeper. Um, so this again had the consequence of shifting migration further to the east, um, to those deserts in Arizona, and then even further east towards the Rio Grande, which didn't have and still doesn't, to a great extent, have any fencing along the border. <clears throat> All right, <clears throat> so as the 90s move into the 2000s, um, you know, there are more campaign promises um, and more efforts to, you know, make a border wall, make border security part of, you know, a political, um, promise and agenda. So this was another, and I, I put this in my, my presentation because again, I thought it was uh, interesting. So Patrick Buchanan um, was, a, was a Republican candidate in the primaries in 1996. And uh, he, you know, among others, right, is, is making this promise, I'm gonna build that fence. Um, you know, we're gonna really fortify and secure our borders. So the New York Times, um, as this becomes talked about more, I was like, well, geez, hmm, what would it cost to build such a fence? And what kind of fence are we talking about? So um, they had gotten estimates in this article. Are you talking a chain link fence? This is how much it's gonna cost you. I love how number four is the Great Wall of China. If you want that along your Southwest border, this is what it's gonna cost you. So it kind of goes through these different scenarios, different products, and, you know, considering <clears throat> the, um, the miles that need to be covered, what the bill is going to be for that. Um, so I just thought it was interesting. It's definitely a reflection of this becoming talked about more, becoming integrated into, again, into, um, you know, campaign promises more. It's seen as something of concern and of importance. <clears throat> Uh, increasingly into the late 90s and 2000s. And then of course, 9-11 happens, right? And that um, has, it elevates it even more. So 
there are two really important acts that are passed after 9-11. These are both under the Bush administration that um, especially in terms of environmental impact and the wall today, they really tie back to these two acts. So the Real ID Act of 2005, you've probably heard of, right? Because it was largely focused on um, those security standards for licenses, right? But within the Real ID Act, there is also a little part to it, which allows for any, it allows for DHS, it allows for the president at the time to dismiss environmental protections for wall construction. So if, you know, any kind of agency or the interior department or something says like, hey, building a wall here might cause flooding or building a wall here infringes upon the ancestral lands of this Native American na nation, which are protected under certain environmental laws, those can be waived in order to build the wall. Um, and then in 2006, the Secure Fencing Act was passed and this authorized 700 miles of fencing to be constructed. Um, at this point, 18 feet high, I think was the height of most of the fencing, double layered fencing. Um, and there was a deadline for this to be constructed by May 30th of 2008. <clears throat> so this was <clears throat> stipulated within that Secure Fence Act of 2006. So with this, then you start to see uh, more significant um, kind of environmental alterations. So I think one of the great examples is what happened um, with Smuggler's Gulch. Um, so this is, and this is located, this is in California, not far from the Tijuana Estuary. Um, in 2004, environmental groups were successful in halting a project to fill the canyons, right? So in 2004, they had wanted to, these are two canyons that had been formed over thousands of years in this area. They wanted to fill them in in order to be able to create a more secure wall. So by 2007, with the Real ID Act and that little area in there where they have wiggle room to waive um, environmental laws, in 2007, the Bush administration used that to dismiss environmental protections. So they waived the Endangered Species Act, the Clean Air Act, the Migratory, Migratory Bird Treaty, five other federal laws. They dug up, as you can see here, two million cubic yards of earth, which I can't even imagine what that looks like, um, dug it up from mountains on the San, San Diego right mountains and dumped that earth into the Smuggler's Gulch to um, fill it in. And that's the image that you see there is sort of the work in progress of filling these in and um, the, the wall as well. Um, and the cost of this was $21 million per square mile to fill these in. Um, and then there are further alterations. And what I've noticed, and this will be kind of one of my themes at the end here, that as under the Bush administration, and I think this is happening under the current administration, as the deadline approaches, right, the Secure Fence Act said, oh, by May 30th, 20, 2008, we want to have the fence completed. So <clears throat> this article here talks about um, approaching that deadline of needing to have this wall construction done. And there were the, the um, efforts or, or the, the opportunities to waive some of these environmental laws were expanded even greater. So in 2008, the, uh, the head of the Homeland Security at the time uh, was Markle Chertoff. He issued two waivers to cover an additional 470 miles of border between California or from California to Texas. And then this included a separate 22 mile stretch in Texas. So Texas is interesting because there's a lot of private land that's around the border in Texas, which affects wall construction. And then there's also the river. Um, but part of that fence, that 22 mile stretch um, was going to be an 18 foot high fence in a flood control levy in a wildlife refuge. And that's the other complication that's um, present a lot of time that this border intersects a number of different wildlife refuges. Um, so 
that was the case here um, as well. So by April of 2008, that's just, you know, roughly a month uh, before this uh, deadline that was established in the Secure Fencing Act, 309 miles of fencing was up. So they're not to that max yet that they wanted. Um, a mixture of concrete posts and tall barriers, depending on if there's primarily foot traffic or vehicle traffic, that depends what kind of um, wall is put up. Uh, <clears throat> at this time in this article and Chertoff had, had uh, asserted or reassured that the Department of Homeland Security had contacted 600 different property owners, held 100 different meetings um, to, to make sure that they're you know, letting people know about this while talking to them about their concerns. Um, but there's also, there's pressures at this point to get the wall up, like let's just get it up um, and uh, try to worry about the other stuff later. Now, and we'll look at, you'll see what the impact of that has been um, when, we, when we get to that in, in just a moment here. Um, now, the current administration, President Trump and his wall is also again a campaign, a campaign promise. This is something that he was talking about from the very beginning. Um, and he promised uh, to build 450 miles of wall by the end of 2020. A lot of this is rebuilding what was already put up under the, the Bush administration. <clears throat> but it's even, even bigger. So 30 feet high instead of 18 feet high and made of steel and concrete. Um, and the money for this wall, we probably all remember him saying that he was going to make Mexico pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, but so what ended up happening to get because the wall is going up, right? I mean, it was going up. It started in April 2019. It's been going up. And it's so funny. I this is not talked about, I feel like in the media much at all. Um, my my 16 year old niece, I was just talking to her and I was because she's always asking all kinds of questions. And, and I was telling her about this. And she said, Wait, the wall is going up. And I said, Yeah, the wall is going up. Um, but so the money 200 or not 2.5 billion dollars was diverted from military pay and pensions to go to wall construction and this was done without congressional approval. Um, the Supreme Court has let this happen and there are efforts right now on the part of the Sierra, Sierra Club and other environmental groups to try to um, challenge this or to get the Supreme Court to lift that stay right, and deal with how this um, funding was secured, but nothing has happened with that just yet. Um, so that's just still kind of sitting um, in the wings. Uh, so to compare the Trump administration to the Bush administration in terms of their use of the waivers that are permitted through the Real ID Act, the Bush administration used those waivers four different times throughout the administration, and the Trump administration has already used waivers 15 times in New Mexico, Texas, California, and Arizona to build what has been built so far, <clears throat> right? So here's an image uh, from the, and this is from the New York Times. This is, you know, the wall in action um, or, you know, the progress in action. And uh, I love this quote from NPR's John Burnett, <clears throat> who's uh, talking about, the border construction in Arizona and the damage that has been done to the cactus columns <clears throat> in the Oregon pipe um, uh, refuge area. And uh, when he says, you know, there was outcry then too in the 2000s when President George W. Bush built the first generation of bollard wall, those barriers topped out at 18 feet. The massive structure rising southwest of Tucson is nearly twice as tall. It looks like it could hold back a herd of T-Rexes. Um, so just to show, give a sense of the scale of it. And then here are um, some of those cactus columns. You can see parts of them cut and lying there. So there's a lot of, um, like the, <clears throat> in so many instances when I was, you know, reading up on all of this, you see DHS, for example, saying, 
Well, like in this, in this exact um, example uh, regarding these cactus columns, they had said that they were replanting only the healthy ones. Like we're gonna take the healthy ones and replant them. So the ones that you see that are cut and that we've removed um, and not replanted, those were old ones that we don't see any use in saving. So, but then there's a lot of speculation on the part of, you know, like national parks rangers, the different, the different people and organizations that work, uh, whether it's through a refuge or the national park service, those who are working on behalf of the landscape or of the animals, um, a lot of times they have some skepticism and they're not quite sure if border patrol or if customs and border patrol and DHS is really um, doing what they had assured that they would do in protecting the environment. So there's a bit of uncertainty and mistrust on both of those sides. So in terms of the environmental impact, one of the great, and this is, you know, I would recommend this for anybody interested in looking into this more, the Sierra Club has um, documented the environmental impact of the wall over decades. So, you know, and the Sierra Club has been around for such a long time. It's, it's a, the largest grassroots environmental organization in the United States. It has a long history in this nation and they have a borderland program that examines the impact. It's focused specifically on this region and looking at the wall and its environmental impact. And they document how it destroys habitats, causes flooding, blocks wildlife migrations and ruins um, cultural and native um, sites, uh, uh, Native American sites um, and other historic sites. So to give some examples in terms of the impact on uh, animals and their ability to migrate and then to give examples of other things that are challenging this, um, some of, and these are some animals that I showed pictures of at the beginning, right? The black bear, jaguars, ocelots, pronghorns for, you know, think of it, their populations for thousands of years have been migrating from one side to the other. A lot of these animals, take the black bear, for example, um, and the, the bighorn sheep, um, they, in the 1800s, some even later, they've been nearly extirpated. So they are, and most of it is on deli now deliberate, you know, efforts to rebuild these populations. They're 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 pretty. What's the word I want to use? They're sensitive. I don't know if they're sensitive, but the you know their populations are just rebuilding now. Uh, taking a, a wall and blocking their migrations completely could undo all of those efforts that have been made to rebuild those populations. Um, and uh, jaguars have been migrating back and forth. And um, in, in 2016, so the Sierra Club and others try to document the migration patterns of the jaguar. Um, in 2016, they found a new jaguar that was photographed just north of a gap in the border wall. Um, and, uh, you know, jaguars in particular, which I did not know, once their populations get to a certain size, male jaguars leave to seek out new territories to um, grow new populations. So they only let them get so large and then they and then they relocate. So their migrations are important to maintaining their um, their population. Um, in terms of plant life, um, I know that there's you know going to be more examples of this. Uh, the one example I have just to show the impact there um, is as early as the 1980s in the Tijuana estuary, right, on the far west coast. Um, silt pollution, which came from construction and not necessarily only construction of the border wall, but border wall construction is um, also a large contributor, caused two plant species to go extinct. Um, and then on top of this, there's climate change. So it's not only just, you know, the wall and then normal migrations, but the reality that climate is, there, there's climate change, and uh, the deserts are becoming drier, and it's going to necessitate greater movement among certain populations of animals. And then on top of the drying due to climate change is the amount of groundwater that's used to build the wall, which I didn't even realize. Um, but 700,000 gallons of groundwater are extracted per day 
to build the wall. And that is just further adding to the already drying up that's um, occurring. Uh, so you can see this article had shown this exchange between the land manager at the San Bernardino Wildlife Refuge um, and then also Fish and Wildlife noting um, the drying up of ponds and trying to save the fish in those ponds. But this is, you know, connected to these two um, sort of these two events. <clears throat> so you've got that. Then there's an environmental impact on uh, Native American nations um, that have, you know, had this land uh, for such a long time. So the two, you've got the uh, Tahana Autumn Nation um, where bulldozers and explosives um, used in the building of the wall have destroyed some of their ancestral lands. Uh, one of those is Monument Hill. And there's a lot of back and forth here with one side saying, you know, yeah, we're, we're being careful and we're trying to protect these. And then, you know, Ned Norris, who is the chairman of the Tahana Autumn Nation, said that he was never consulted. He was never talked about border wall construction before it happened. He didn't learn about the blasting until the day that it was happening. Um, so it's been difficult for these nations to do much when they're not informed and consulted in advance um, of what's going on. Um, and then there's also <clears throat> the Kumayai Nation, um, and that's the, the map that I have here. So they're located, uh, they're, they're uh, land goes between California and uh, Mexico. They've got the border going right in the middle of their um, lands. Um, the roads for construction have, <clears throat> you know, in addition to you've got the destruction of the border wall, but um, natural flora that they use for rituals have been um, removed um, due to the roads that were built for the construction. Um, and then particularly, I think it was also the Kumayai Nation um, they have, uh, you know, they travel back and forth across the border. They have rituals where they have like migration proceedings and they, not proceeding, migration rituals, they move and it's part of a religious practice that they have. Um, and those kinds of practices are becoming also um, more difficult. And then there's the flooding. Um, so, which I think there's, there's, so much documented on this. Um, there have been repeated flood flooding in Nogales. Um, and of course you've, you know, there's Nogales, Arizona, and Nogales in Sonora, Mexico. The flooding is almost always worse on the Mexican side. So there was flooding in 2008, 2011, 2014, 2018. This is an area that does, you know, in, in, in particular seasons, there's sort of like a monsoon season where they do get heavy rains. Um, but from what I've read, the, the destruction that these rains lately have caused and in connection with issues with the wall um, are not like associated with, with, with what, it, what would have been um, normal. So in 2008, that led to $8 million in damage. <clears throat> so then DHS had to go back and they retrofitted all of the fencing to include gates that they could open up to let the floodwaters go through. Because a big part of the problem is that debris catches up on the fencing and it acts as a dam and it makes the flooding so much worse. In 2011, it went through a fence and totally washed it away. And in 2014, again, it caused seven, several million dollars in damages. And then in 2018, two people were killed due to the flooding. <clears throat> so in 2008, with that first example, Mexican engineers found that a storm runoff channel was blocked by a five foot tall barrier that was put in by US Customs and Border Protection. So then that had to be remedied um, in the aftermath. Right? And then there's more remedies, uh, which is where I think we start to see some of the evidence of this being um, done sometimes quickly, especially as the deadline approaches. So in 2009, um, the Homeland Security Department uh, promised that it would devote $50 million to mitigation measures to compensate for the environmental damage that the wall had caused to animals, plants, and to Native American religious sites. 
Um, so they pledged that money. What's interesting is that they pledged that money and they had already spent $40 million during the previous two years on environmental problems. Um, you know, some of them being like dealing with that, that storm runoff channel being blocked, right? Um, so the other part of this, which you would think should have been happening all along, but sounds like perhaps it wasn't, to have the Homeland Security Department work with the Interior Department. Of course, the goal of the Interior Department is to protect America's natural landscapes. Um, so there is, you know, there should be some cooperation between these two parts. Um, and then Janet Napolitano, who was the head of DHS at that time in 2009, promised an evaluation of the wall project at that point. I need to look in further in, ter in terms of what happened. It does look like, um, you know, once she did um, take away some funding for um, the wall project, um, feeling that the issues that might happen weren't fully documented um, uh, and, and worth to go through with some of that. <clears throat> so, you know, all those examples of flooding that happened in Nogales in 2008 and so on. Um, and to bring this up to more present, where there's still concerns over the wall being built in some areas and whether it will cause flooding, um, Star County, Texas is one of those areas. In 2008, Customs and Border Patrol said it's too dangerous to build a wall here. It will cause damaging flooding if a wall is built there. By 2018, things shifted. Congress approved $1.6 billion to increase security measures. That included building 100 miles of wall, 33 miles in Texas, and some of that in Star County, Texas. Um, many who live there, although not all, um, are opposed to the wall because of the flooding potential. So they want border security, but of course, right, there's the concern of the flooding that it might cause. So throughout this whole back and forth over, you know, this stretch of wall and, you know, going from we can't build it to yes, we're going to build it. There was a disagreement between the US branch of the international, <clears throat> I never get all these words right, International Boundary and Water Commission. There's a US branch to that and a Mexican branch to that. They both have engineers and they evaluate on either side, what is the potential for flooding if a wall is built? Um, in 2012, the US branch signed off on the wall, but the Mexican branch did not. Um, and uh, as far as I know, it's still, the Mexican branch has still not approved um, or their engineers feel that, you know, the flooding is going to be too damaging um, to go through with. <clears throat> All right, so that wall, here's a picture of the debris gathering. This is part of the wall that was put in under the Trump administration. And I just think it's so, you know, interesting to deal with the monsoon season, they had to leave it open. So they had to open the gates for, for months during this monsoon season in order to minimize the impact of flooding. So then what's the purpose of the wall, right? I don't know. <laughs> <That's>, <clears throat> All right. Uh, and then migrant deaths. Uh, so, you know, flooding impacts human communities. And then I see this as being another important human impact. Um, so here's uh, migrant deaths. Notice, you know, the most of them being uh, occurring here in the Tucson sectors. This is showing migrants who are crossing the deserts. So starting with Operation Gatekeeper, and then it just continues pushing migrants towards these more desolate regions um, in, order to, in order to cross. Um, so in 2008, the totals there being reported by the ACLU was uh, 390. And then moving forward to 2019, this is data collected by the Missing Migrants Project, which is part of the UN. And they have documented 2,403 deaths since 2014. 497 were lost in 2019. Most were found in the Rio Grande, which was in 2019 compared to 2018, there was a 26% increase in those found in the Rio Grande between those two years, and then many others found in the 
um, desert. So 2018 thus far looks like it's been the worst year yet in terms of these migrant deaths. And then of course the other shift is, you know, <clears throat> in the 90s, many of them were probably Mexican immigrants. Now they're finding many more who are from Guatemala, El Salvador, right? So, so many of those are Central American migrants um, dying in the remote regions. <clears throat> of our border. <clears throat> and this shows some of the, so there's efforts that um, organizations take to try to identify these bodies, um, to try to then be able to inform their loved ones of what happens um, <clears throat> to them. You know, the desert is really hard on the body. It's, you know, sometimes it's really hard to be able to secure any identifying uh, information on the person. And then just, and this will be where I uh, conclude with today, just the reminder for us that these are communities that live on the border. Like there's a, there's a border going through them, there's a wall going through them, but these are communities that have been there for so long. So if we even think back to when this border was secured by the United States, right? After the <clears throat> Mexican-American War, you can see what was acquired, you know, through treaties at the end of that conflict. And then that disputed territory is purchased later under the Gadsden Purchase. So we're really looking at like the 1850s-ish, right? In a grand scheme is not really so much time. Um, and to think that it's only until the mid 20th century that there's an effort to literally, you know, separate these two with a, a wall or a fence, um, you know, I think it's um, important to keep that in mind. So I wanna show a, it's like a two minute clip because I think it's just the best way of helping us visually see how close literally these communities are to this um, border. This is a little clip from uh, Associated Press from 2019. And so rather than click on that link, I already have it open. And then I'm just gonna run through my themes and then that will be it. Um, let me make sure. So you should all be able to hear this, I think. We got authorization to replace 14 miles of primary barrier here in San Diego. We have just under 11 miles of that completed. Uh, primarily that was the old landing map fence that was put up by Border Patrol Agents and National Guard in the 90s. It was falling down. So when we started the project, we kind of stumbled upon several buildings, uh, homes, if you will, uh, this, this shrine that's here behind me, that were encroaching onto the border or were so close to the fence that there was gonna be significant damage to them uh, if we didn't take extra precautions. There are a couple of structures. When I say structures, I mean like a normal house. It was built by contractors. It was built uh, professionally that croaches in, into the U.S. We're currently working with Mexico on how to resolve those, the International Boundary and Water Commission. Um, but in areas like this, the common American would, would refer to it more as like a shack. It's literally built out of plywood and scrap material material, but they're very meaningful to the people that live here. Um, so we were able to preserve several of those simply by taking our time um, and then working with the people on the south side so they could make an adjustment, maybe move some stuff farther south. It is an ongoing project that we haven't resolved every one of the issues as of yet. A lot of the people that live in this community are not smugglers. They have no intention of illegally entering the United States. They just live here. We interact with them on a regular basis. This is all our community. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so just, just so I'm, I'm hesitant to call these conclusions because in all honesty, I would feel more comfortable if I did like more research, but from what I've seen so far and what I've read, these are some themes or, you know, general, you know, ideas that I've, uh, kind of come that have come to my mind, right. As I've looked through this, that, there is definitely a different perspective of the border for those in Washington, D.C. or us in the Northeast 
than those who live on it. The local presses, like the local presses in, in towns in Texas and Arizona, the border wall is all over them. I mean, you, you can find articles on the border wall all the time. And there's, you can tell that it is something that is important and of concern to those communities, of course, because they're right there. Um, the impact for them is of course, you know, is much more personal. Um, so that's one thing. So I think from our perspective, we're, we're far removed from it and we see that black line and we think like, put up a wall, you know, what's it gonna do? Um, the projects, the wall projects <clears throat> can, you know, and and I'm sh I've seen examples of this and I'm sure there are more, interfere with the binational commissions and agencies that are in place. So there are a lot of binational treaties, uh, nonprofit organizations, refugees that protect people they're there to protect that environment and their work becomes more difficult when there is um, a monumental wall project at play. Um, so I think there's some challenges there. And, um, you know, wall projects have been rushed. There are these deadlines put in place. We need to have 470 miles put up by May 30th, you know, 2008. And then that's a promise that they make and then there's this rush to do it and then things aren't done in conjunction with the right agencies they're not done you know necessarily um with keeping the environment in mind and then there's stuff that happens like flooding and then there's all of this money that's put into these mitigation measures and trying to fix things and um you know, we have some examples of that in 2008 2009 I, i'm sure there there's probably other examples but um, those are some of the conclusions that I, <clears throat> or themes that I have come across throughout this. Um, and that's where um, I will uh, conclude. So if anybody has any questions, I'm anybody happy to try to answer some questions. Questions that they would like. To ask. You can either mute yourself. Or... Does Juan do you have a question? I think Kelsey. Uh, yeah. Was a little bit. Um, you know, it's it's a very informative and it's very educational. I have to say, I admit that I didn't realize um, there uh, there has been the environmental impact. Um, you know, I I. Um, so I, I learned a lot today. Uh, I'm just wondering, um, with the, the new administration um, taking place in January next year, um, what about the wall projects? Are they going to be dropped or? I don't know. <laughs> and you know, the hard part is, is that so much of it has already been done now. Like it, over the summer, um, like in July, when was this? In June and July of 2020, like Trump had visited Arizona and he was celebrating 200 miles having been built. So, so much of it has occurred starting in April, 2019. So I'm curious, I'm not sure what um, a Biden administration will do because the other thing is, you know, this is not, I don't, this is not just a Republican thing. Democrats have been involved in it too. Mm -hmm. So, you know, look at what the Clinton administration, you know, put forward with, with Operation Gatekeeper. So I'm curious to see, I, I don't know what, what will happen. Right, that'll be interesting. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Are there other questions? I'm sorry, my internet connection is not not the best right now. This was a fascinating presentation, Ashley, and I thank you for it because it's so often, like you say, we're so far removed and you know we only hear uh, a little bit and it seems like the wall is more of a symbolic thing that is used for you know political calculations rather than both sides looking at what the actual impact is to communities and to both countries so um 
so yeah, I mean, this is really, there's so many more considerations than what people initially think. So I thank you for bringing the environmental perspective. I mean, of course, the humanitarian perspectives are of the utmost importance, but the environmental perspectives are, you know, definitely, definitely a big concern as well. I see Debbie put in an article. Thank you, Debbie. You know, it's so funny when I was doing this, I haven't even hardly, you know, I didn't even think about Biden. I didn't even think I was like, you know, just like, so um, I think because most of this was, you know, made or I, you know, put most of this together when before the election even happened. And um, I was, I was clearly not even thinking of what if Biden wins the election and what's going to happen <laughs> there? Um, I think I was just you know, in the, in the moment uh, that I was in. Um, but yeah, and I think, you know, the thing I kept asking myself and I was imagining that I think a lot of people in the Northeast might ask is like, what's the big deal, right? If it doesn't, even the environmental impacts, if it doesn't directly impact me, what's the big deal? Um, I think that's a challenge or something, you know, to help people see that, even though this isn't land that's that you live in or a landscape that you live in, that these are still, there's going to be, right? There's going to be some sort of domino effect. Let's say a certain animal does end up going extinct or even is extirpated in that area, right? If you look at so many other studies that we can look at that that has some sort of domino effect that sometimes you can't even foresee at the beginning, but the loss of that animal then impacts some other animal in some way. And then down the road, it can even impact humans in some way, right? Um, so the fact that this is still part of our country and it can affect you know, the, the landscape and the environment in that area, I think is important. And plus our money is going towards it. You know, Our tax money is going to building this and, um, and potentially having those kinds of negative impacts. You know, I think in that way, we do play a part even though we're way over here in the Northeast. All right, thank Susie, you. do you have a question? Yeah, I just had a comment. Uh, I wanna thank you, it was a fabulous talk, so enlightening. And most people don't tie the environmental aspects to the wall. And the Biden administration has said they are going to rejoin um, the climate change treaty and climate change will become a very important um, uh, uh, it, 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 it issue. So perhaps what you've done is brought to light and revealed a way that we could lobby and get some change uh, about the wall through the environmental aspects. So I think the work you've done is very important and hope there'll be some ways that you can get it out to the wider community. Yeah, we will, we will see, you know, and, and it's interesting too, that it's not just, you know, not just the wall, the Sierra Club talks about all the vehicles too. I mean, the number of border patrol vehicles has skyrocketed since the nineties. And so, you know, that's also part of that's having an environmental impact as well. And apparently, although I haven't found the images, you can see the tracks of vehicles in space because there's so many of them and they, you know, there's, there's so much um, uh, movement, but that's another, that's another contributor in addition to the wall is, is that, that vehicle traffic as well. And another environmental point that I think doesn't get talked about as frequently, um, but climate change, you know, is identified as a big geopolitical risk. I mean, this is forcing a lot of communities to migrate, forcing scarcity of resources. We know what happens when there are scarcity of resources, there's more conflict. So, you know, addressing environmental issues, you know, you may think, oh, well, who cares about these animals? But, you know, obviously we all should care about the animals, but it also is a human security issue too. So, and I, and I agree with Susan, Ashley, that you made that connection very well in this presentation. Well, thank you. It was fun. I learned, I learned a ton. And um, like I said, I didn't expect, 
um, to find that there's just, there's so much, <clears throat> it's crazy. Well, I thank you very much, unless anyone has other questions. I see some of my students from English 122 are here. Yay, thanks for joining us. I hope you guys all enjoyed it. I'm sure you did. It was just fascinating. So round of applause for our featured speaker. Yay. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. Well, thank you, everybody. And um, look for we'll have some more GCP events next semester. Uh, we're going to culminate with a global read. We'll be selecting a text that addresses environmental issues. Um, and we'll have a number of events next semester, too. So you can look for those as well. So once again, thank you. Oh, and one more thing it. before too many people sign off because Debbie's comment made me think of it. In the future, Debbie and I will hopefully be taking a group of students to the border. So we'll be able to see this right firsthand. So it's been um, waylaid a little bit by, by COVID, but there are still plans hopefully to move forward with the summer program uh, and take some students to uh, the border in Arizona uh, so that we can witness some of this stuff firsthand. Awesome. All right. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you again, everybody. Bye bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Great. Thanks. Yeah. Bye.